Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is David Cash. I'm a member of the marketing team here at Mounts. I'm glad you've taken the time to join us today as we look at our topic of how to create an effective torque measurement and calibration program. Now just keep in mind that if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, feel free to pop those into the chat and we'll take a look at those at the end of the presentation. But uh, we do have a little bit of ground to cover, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, let's first talk about the value of uh, actually measuring torque. And so if you want to improve something, uh, you need to be able to measure it uh, to go from one state to another and see what the difference is. That's uh, pretty self-explanatory. But there are some values uh, that we can use within the torque-related field of our tools um, if we do measure those and at what point during the operation. Um, if we take a closer look at specific uh, tools um, and how they are uh, operating, if we are collecting that information, um, it's really going to help us identify areas that uh, may be an issue. Uh, it's going to help us look at uh, what type of root causes may be uh, happening during the assembly process and the uh, how certain tools uh, may be functioning. Um, there's also uh, something else that we may be able to get uh, from the actual uh, measurement process that may not necessarily be related to the actual tools themselves, but it could be uh, obviously, the joint characteristics within the application. Uh, if there are, is an issue with material, uh, with a uh, maybe a possible uh, change in your fastener vendor, uh, things like that can help to uncover uh, other items uh, other than the fastening process uh, within the measurement uh, happenings, uh, so to speak. <laughs> anyway, uh, it also uh, gives us the ability to document those uh, readings that we are beginning. Um, if you are an ISO uh, 9001, um, this may be uh, something that you can uh, typically use for uh, showing your continuous improvement uh, within those requirements. Um, and then we can also look at the uh, specific data as it relates to a specific tool. Uh, or a set of tools to see how those perform um, over time. And we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit uh, near the end of the presentation, but you may be able to adjust your calibration schedule uh, based off of the data that you receive on uh, certain tools um, or, again, groups of tools. So um, with any uh, torque-related process, uh, there are uh, certain failures and quality issues that uh, need to be uh, thought about um, and considered. Um, and obviously we, we know that if uh, something isn't torqued right, then we're not getting the correct uh, clamp load that we would be looking for. Um, the clamp force uh, is ideally what we are trying to achieve when we are uh, doing the, the torquing process. And if something happens during that, then we're losing that uh, that clamp force uh, that can cause parts to fail because of movement, uh, which is the whole idea. So if we have an over torque situation, we could be putting um, the fastener uh, past its yield point. Uh, we'll touch on that in this presentation as well. Uh, and any shock or vibration can cause that that fastener to break. Uh, again, if it's not uh, if it's not torqued correctly and it's under torqued, uh, in any type of vibration can cause that fastener to completely uh, back out. Uh, or if the fastener is not fully seated uh, and lifted, again, we are uh, not having the correct clamp load that is needed or clamp force uh, generated for us to make sure that the assembly um, is correct. There's also uh, the human element that plays a part in, in that as well. Um, but that is a another topic for another discussion. But uh, let's go ahead and uh, talk about... Uh, the differences um, that you may hear, um, and that's going to be uh, the difference between static torque and dynamic torque. Uh, the main difference is that um, static torque is a measurement of a fastener that has already been tightened. Um, and dynamic torque is the ability to test that fastener while it is being um, fastened. Uh, so that is the main difference between the two. 
uh, dynamic is testing uh, with either a power tool or a hand tool um, as the operation um, is happening. And then static torque would be uh, coming back um, in an auditing type of situation where we would be checking that fastener. You also may hear this uh, in connection with uh, the actual torque testing um, sensors. So we have uh, a static torque sensor, which um, does not have any movement available to it. Uh, if you put a tool in there and you turn that tool, the uh, sensor itself does not move. It is just measuring the amount of um, torsion that is happening. Uh, that would be considered a, sti a, stag <laughs> a static uh, transducer. Or you would have the ability to uh, use a dynamic sensor, which allows us to capture readings as the tool is performing uh, the task. And we'll take a look at that in our demo presentation of what that looks like. And so that's going to uh, lead us right into our poll question uh, for today. Um, and that's going to be um, in your uh, measurement uh, currently. Um, are you doing uh, mostly static testing, dynamic testing, or a, a combination of both? And so I'll give you just a few seconds to go ahead and answer that. Uh, and then we'll continue on with the presentation. I uh, thank you very much for uh, participating in uh, the poll. Uh, it looks like uh, more than half uh, are uh, testing both static and dynamic um, with uh, static in second. So that, uh, that is uh, good to know um, as we move through um, what understanding the different stages of measuring torque are. And there are uh, basically three uh, different facets of the manufacturing process that we can um, implement uh, different torque testing um, items. Uh, and that's going to be uh, prior to the assembly. It's going to be during the assembly and then um, after the assembly. And so uh, prior to the assembly, we're looking at setting up a tool uh, to uh, meet or uh, achieve a certain torque value. Uh, we can also use that uh, for doing uh, tool capability studies um, through an R&D type of uh, process. Um, during the assembly, we're looking at doing uh, torque verification or torque validation. And then after the assembly, we would be conducting torque audits uh, and then also a torque recalibration um, of the tools uh, that we are using. So those are kind of the three different stages that are, are broken up uh, on where you can do uh, certain testing um, of your torque. Now, um, when we're talking about uh, or prior to the assembly, um, we're looking at setting up our tools uh, to do that. If we uh, purchased a tool or we received a tool from, say, another department, uh, we want to be able to set that tool um, up that would be used uh, would be used with a uh, torque analyzer. Um, and those can be either a preset hand tool, could be an adjustable hand tool, um, or it could be uh, power tools um, as well, electric torque screwdrivers, uh, clutch tools, air tools. Um, all of those things um, we can use uh, to test the torque uh, that we would like uh, that tool to be set at. Um, that is uh, one thing uh, or one thing to keep in mind, though, is that when we do set up a tool on a torque analyzer, uh, the torque that the tool is producing um, out on the floor may be slightly different. Um, and that's due to the joint characteristics of the either rundown adapter or joint simulator that you may be using on the torque analyzer versus the actual um, application. And so there are certain ways that we can look at that. Um, differently, and we will uh, take a look at that in our, our demo presentation. But 
Um, for uh, the tool setups, we would use torque analyzers uh, like this one uh, with a built-in torque sensor, um, or we could use a, an analyzer like this that has a built-in sensor and also allows us to add additional sensors. Uh, so we would be testing um, hand tools uh, on that. Um, if we did want to test a power tool, uh, like you see here, we uh, use a rundown adapter or joint simulator to allow the tool to get up to its running RPM. Uh, and then when that tool shuts off, it's going to provide us our torque. Uh, and that's a really uh, important point to think about is that RPM does play a fact uh, or a part in the actual uh, torque that's, that's happening. Um, and we need to make sure that that is uh, taken uh, in account for because if we just put a tool into a, in this case would be a static uh, reaction style transducer, that tool is immediately going to reach torque and shut off um, and we're not allowing any RPM to develop at all within the inertia that is developed within the tool. So uh, one thing that is uh, one thing uh, to keep in mind uh, when we're looking at, at the uh, setting up the tool. Now, if we were to uh, look at trying to develop a, uh, a torque specification on a certain component, or if we're having some issues with a particular assembly, um, there are ways that we can use um, a different style of sensor um, that is going to help us see exactly what we're getting um, on our torque. And that's going to be the use of a torque analyzer and a rotary type torque sensor or a dynamic uh, sensor. Uh, and so uh, typically when we're doing this type of study, uh, what we would like to do is do a, a destructive type of test where we take that joint um, and we run that fastener to its failure point. Uh, and then we see what those values are and we can then reduce uh, the torque that's being generated um, to uh, a certain percentage of that failure point or, or yield point. Um, and that's, this is what this graph will show. Um, as we apply load to uh, a fastener, um, at some point that fastener is going to reach the uh, yield point. Um, and that basically means that uh, once the fastener has reached that point, um, it can no longer um, return to its original shape. And so, with the bolted joint assembly, um, the fastener itself uh, is working like a spring. Um, as we apply torque or load to it, that fastener will begin to stretch, uh, causing our clamp force that we're looking for. Um, and so once we go past the yield point, we will enter the plastic region uh, and that fastener will no longer return to its uh, original shape it will be uh, permanently deformed. And so um, everything below the yield point is going to be the elastic region of that. Um, and this animation just kind of shows uh, what that would look like if we did take a fastener um, past its yield point. So as the nut is being uh, torqued, that fastener is stretching, uh, causing the tension within the fastener to create our clamp force. And again, if we take that uh, torque um, and stretch that bolt uh, or farther than its, its yield point, it will then uh, again be in the plastic region and it will no longer return um, to its, its original shape. And so you will be able to uh, see that and measure that uh, and you would be able to see um, that fastener has reached its yield point. And so when a fastener is in that state, it is very uh, susceptible to actual breakage. Um, again, with any type of shock or vibration, uh, that fastener has the uh, opportunity to fail. Um, and so uh, during the assembly process, um, we can uh, use uh, the torque verification and uh, torque validation uh, process. And this is a, uh, a, the ability to uh, test the tool uh, either while the tool is running down um, on the line. Uh, again, we can use a rotary sensor for that uh, type of uh, data collection. 
Um, or we could use a, a, an analyzer again with a rundown adapter. We take the analyzer to the tool out on the floor. We go ahead and do the testing uh, and make sure that the tool is still performing um, how we would like, uh, because you, uh, if you don't have the ability to do the testing, then you're relying on uh, when you do send that tool out for calibration, um, you have your uh, as found date. And if there were any adjustments uh, made to that tool, if it was out of calibration, um, at what point during that process uh, or during that time period did the tool go out of calibration? Um, you really have no idea. Uh, and so by doing a, a torque uh, verification or validation process, you do have that ability to uh, monitor the tool and make sure that it is not going out of its calibration between the uh, calibration dates. So that can be achieved either with the use of an analyzer and a rotary sensor or uh, a torque analyzer and a joint simulator. Um, for power tools, uh, if you're using um, hand tools, uh, you would not need the uh, joint simulator, uh, but you still could use the um, rotary sensor with a, with a hand tool um, as well. And so this is what uh, that would look like. Uh, we have the ability to put the rotary sensor um, in between the tool and the part. And this is going to allow us to get um, or capture the data from the tool actually on your part. Um, and that is the best scenario uh, that you are getting because you're validating the tool actually on your component. So um, after the assembly um, has taken place, uh, we do have uh, the ability to do the torque auditing. Um, and there are a, a number of different uh, kinds of tests that can happen after the assembly um, has been uh, completed. And these might all fall under uh, the category of residual torque. So you may hear that term or uh, someone may talk about residual torque. Um, the truth is that once we remove the tool from a fastener, there is no longer any torque uh, on that fastener. There is just the tension that's created within the fastener itself. Uh, granted, there may be a little bit of uh, torsion um, that may be, be be detectable as torque, but uh, in order for us to measure torque, we actually have to uh, get the faster moving again. Um, and there are uh, a couple different tests that we can use. Um, that would be the first movement test, uh, a loosening test, and the uh, marking test. And each one um, has um, advantages and disadvantages uh, to them. Uh, but the one thing to keep in mind is that when we're doing this type of um, auditing, um, because of the fact that there are different uh, parameters and characteristics that happen during the actual rundown um, that aren't going to be present during the auditing uh, portion. So uh, that is uh, these types of values um, need to be uh, correlations to the actual um, torque that was applied uh, at the assembly during that process. And so they aren't going to be as exact as uh, you may like them to be, but um, through uncertainty, you can certainly develop a, a correlation um, for each type of test uh, to then say, if I get this X during the torque auditing process, um, I know that during the, the actual uh, rundown that we, we, we got the right uh, torque value. So if we take a look at, at the first movement test, um, typically this is we're just turning the fastener um, in the tightening direction, and we just want to move it a few degrees of rotation. So if there are 360 degrees in a um, the circumference of a circle, then we just want to move it um, anywhere from three to five degrees and measure what that value is. Um, and this is done either with a, a rotary sensor or uh, more commonly it's done with a, a, a digital torque wrench um, that has a torque and angle uh, feature in that. Um, and you can set the digital wrench to uh, tell us what the value is at a certain degree of movement. And that's typically, again, three to five degrees. 
And why do we uh, use the, the three to five degrees? Um, that's because um, if we look at the, uh, the coefficient of friction, um, it, if trying to get something moving, um, it sometimes takes more effort or in this case, more torque to get the fastener moving again than what we may typically see during its rotation. So uh, you may see a slight uh, rise in the torque and then it will settle down in the uh, area from three to five degrees. And so that can give you a, a better representation of uh, the, the torque than if you were to measure it um, at the peak torque, which may give you a, a much higher, uh, or not much higher, but a higher value than at degrees three or five. Um, so that is the uh, first movement test. Uh, next would be the breakaway test. And basically this means that we just measure the value of the actual breakaway. So we're, we're taking the fastener in the loosening direction and we're just measuring what that value is uh, from the breakaway. And this value is typically uh, lower than the actual uh, torquing value. Um, and that's because uh, there is a little bit of torsion, as I mentioned, in the fastener, uh, and that is helping us to uh, release the, uh, the fastener. Um, so the breakaway will uh, typically have a lower uh, value than the tightening value. And then the third test is going to be uh, the marking test um, or... Um, yeah, so basically we put a, uh, a line on the fastener, a line on the part, uh, and then we go ahead and we can then break the uh, fastener away. Uh, and then we measure the torque once we bring those two lines back together. Um, and this will give us a, a better representation of uh, the first movement test or the breakaway test. Um, again, it's not going to be um, exact because uh, of the uh, conditions that I mentioned before, whether it be RPM, lubricant, or um, other factors, but it's going to give us a good representation of where we're at um, with the fastener. And again, you can develop a correlation between this test value and the actual uh, value that uh, was uh, seen during the operation. Um, or during the, the testing of that. And so that will lead us into um, our uh, demonstration uh, for today. And uh, what we're going to look at is uh, the use of being able to test our tool um, out on the line and doing that torque validation or uh, torque verification process uh, with our uh, tool. And so I have um, our PTT um, analyzer here. I'll go ahead and power that on. Uh, then we also have our uh, rotary, uh, our RTSX um, 50 uh, I here, and this measures um, between five to 50 inch pounds. Uh, and then we have our tool, uh, which is set for uh, five inch pounds. And this will uh, give us that ability to um, see exactly what we're getting um, on our part um, or the, the value that the tool is producing. Um, and so we have uh, this thread block here. We'll work with these uh, six fasteners um, on the end here. Um, and so to go ahead and uh, install the uh, sensor, um, it's pretty simple. We use the same uh, disconnect, uh, quick disconnect features on the quarter inch hex. So the bit goes in this end and then we attach the sensor to this end, um, and now we can go ahead and uh, do our testing. And so let me just move this out of the way. And so um, here is our uh, analyzer. And so if we go ahead and run our fastener down, let me make sure I'm not in the way. <laughs> so you can see that. All right, so we'll go ahead and run the fastener. And so you can see we're at uh, 5.02. And then we can clear that. Now we also have an auto clear feature on here, but I don't want to make sure that 
accidentally clears us. So we're at 5.03, and 4.96. And 5.06 and 4.99. And so we can um, measure this uh, against our uh, tool uh, that we had during um, our calibration setup if this tool was set up on a uh, torque analyzer. Uh, and again, then we can look at what the differences might be with our joint simulator. Uh, and we can make some adjustments there to make sure that we're, we're getting um, the correct uh, value here. Now we could also, um, as I mentioned, we could do this with a hand tool. Um, so if we uh, take the uh, same setup that we have here, and then we just use a uh, torque screwdriver, we can do the same uh, type of thing here. Now this uh, screwdriver is set for uh, 10 and almost 11 inch pounds. Let's make sure I get it out of the way. And so we can measure uh, with the hand tool on our application um, and get those same uh, readings. Uh, again, this allows us to be able to uh, test the tool um, on the floor uh, and we can then track how that tool performs um, and uh, that will move us to our uh, torque calibration um, discussion here. Now, there are a number of different ways that uh, people use uh, torque calibration. Um, it could be, uh, it is uh, merely a time-based type of uh, setting where uh, every year we send a tool uh, out for calibration no matter um, how much it was used. Uh, and we then get that information back. It could be every six months, every 18 months, um, no matter the usage that tool is sent out on a, a time-based um, setting. There are other customers that will use um, a torque analyzer like this, uh, in this scenario, uh, where we're only gonna send out a tool if we see it falling out of its calibration or if it needs adjustment. Uh, it then is sent in for adjustment uh, and or repair um, that scenario. So in that case, we're looking at um, how a tool performs uh, when that tool needs to be uh, sent out for uh, recalibration. Now, every tool, uh, because of the, uh, the traceability that is used within the analyzer, um, those uh, readings are uh, traceable back to uh, the standard. So um, when a torque analyzer is calibrated, it's done with uh, wheels and weights that are certified and calibrated. Um, and those wheels and weights are also um, calibrated uh, to a higher standard. So as we move up, all of this uh, data that is collected is traceable uh, back to um, its known value. And so Anytime you uh, test a tool or you are uh, calibrating a tool on a torque analyzer, um, that tool and those readings are traceable back to a, a certain standard. So um, when a customer is doing testing on a specific tool and using those values to um, either validate if the tool can, can continue to be um, in service or if it needs to be uh, calibrated uh, or sent out for recalibration, um, that would be the difference uh, that can be used in um, when and how a, a tool gets uh, calibrated. So um, with that, that will uh, lead us to um, the end of our presentation and we can jump right in to our questions um, and answers. I will uh, do my best to answer those uh, questions. And so, uh, Chris, do we have any questions? Morning, Dave. Uh, yeah. We have a few questions. Um, first one is, what are the best practices when validating a, a new automated torque device compared to like a traditional manual process where there's no like legacy of residual torque? 
Uh, let's see. I'm not sure I understand fully what's being asked. I guess if they're trying to validate an automated fastening process versus a manual process. Okay. So um, uh, in that case, I mean, you could validate it with a, a rotary sensor um, if that uh, does allow um, for that. Um, within the automated process, um, or you can take the system offline um, and then um, validate it uh, that way. We've had uh, scenarios um, where they have actually um, taken a, uh, an automated process and they've created an additional uh, process within that where the tool um, it was, uh, I believe it was on a, um, on a robot. Uh, they would then have the program uh, send the tool to the torque analyzer uh, where it would be tested. Uh, and then the, then the program would be then changed back to the um, operation program uh, and then go through um, that they would do that. So you could do that a couple different ways. Again, you could do it with the uh, torque analyzer with the built-in sensor or um, a, uh, reaction style sensor plugged into the analyzer, um, or you can use a rotary sensor um, in line if that could be done um, through that process uh, to measure it actually on the part. All right, Dave, thanks. Uh, next question we had is, in like a destructive fasting process where you're trying to determine the torque spec, is there like a recommendation on how many screws should be tested to help determine that torque spec? So um, the recommendation would be uh, the more, the better. Um, so the more data points that you can get, um, that is certainly going to help. Um, now, depending on um, the uh, value of the part or um, how many times um, that can be done um, is really dependent on uh, how necessary that particular um, operation is. Uh, so. Uh, the more data we can have, the better, but um, you would at least uh, need to have some uh, representative data to be able to uh, make a good determination um, at which point is the joint failing, so. All right, Dan, thanks. Another question we had is, when measuring dynamic torque, what items can influence torque while fastening the joint? So um, the items um, here are going to be uh, the fastener itself, um, the quality of that fastener, uh, how well is it deburred, um, those types of, of things uh, with the actual joint. Um, RPM, uh, if we're using a power tool, um, is going to affect uh, the um, rundown. Um, and then the largest one uh, probably uh, is going to be lubrication, uh, because if we add any type of lubrication to the, uh, the fastening that uh, necessarily isn't there all the time, uh, then we're going to be adding uh, a much greater clamp force with the same amount of torque. Uh, so um, all of those types of factors can play um, a part um, in the actual assembly. Uh, the other component is going to be the actual operator. Um, if we are looking at an operation that may include a, a click wrench, um, that is a very um, operator dependent type of tool. So once the operator uh, hears the click or feels the click, they need to stop pulling. But if they don't, then they're adding a tremendous amount of over torque to that fastener. Um, even if they double click or triple click, um, depending on their mood, uh, those types of things can really affect the uh, overall um, outcome that we may be seeing on a particular joint. All right, thanks, Dave. Another question is, when calibrating like torque wrenches, is there a recommend, recommended time interval to do those? Is it based on a monthly or a tool cycle? Uh, so uh, it may be uh, certainly dependent on the on how critical that assembly might be. Um, again, if you have the ability to do the torque uh, verification, uh, then you can certainly um, do that based off of what may be um, useful for that particular application. Um, I will tell you that we have customers that um, 
The operators will test their tools before the shift. They'll use them. They'll test them after the shift. Um, we have some customers that will do that once a week. Uh, and then we have other customers that will uh, take readings on a torque al analyzer. They save those readings. Then they go use the tool. Uh, then they bring the tool back to the analyzer and test it again um, while that tool um, is being used. Uh, so before that tool gets put onto uh, another fastener, they do that testing process again. Um, and those are for really critical, uh, safety critical type of assemblies. Um, so it just depends on the actual application. All right, Dave, it looks like that's all the questions we have for today. All right, uh, I'd like to say thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, we look forward to uh, next month's webinar. So with that, have yourself a good day and we'll see you next time.